1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to start there tonight. And um, I want us to pray for one another. And um, we got some people going through a fiery trial. Okay? And uh, so I want you to, you don't know who it is. You don't know what's going on. Uh, I do. God does. And uh, so I want you to pray. Pray for everybody that you can think of and maybe you'll catch it. All right. Maybe you'll get the right one. But God knows how to take care of it. All right. But there's not anything that we go through that the Lord isn't there with us while we're going through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And your Bible says that, and God's the Bible, and God doesn't lie. Somebody say amen. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. So beloved, you are the beloved. We are in the beloved. We're the beloved of Jesus Christ. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If... Verse 14, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Let me keep reading a little bit. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer. Or as a busybody in other men's matters, four things there. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, and I can tell you, I believe in being a Christian. I am a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in the teachings of Jesus. I trust, uh, I trust the Word of God. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory God, let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of God. There's, there's pictures of that in your Bible that God draws that must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for always hearing us when we cry out to you. I thank you, God, for always loving us the way you do. And Father, it seems sometimes that when we go through fiery trials, when we go through trouble, when we are in any kind of tribulation, it seems like, Father, that we're alone, but we're not. We've never been alone. You've always been there with us. You're the one that's helped us get through everything that we've gone through in our life. You're the one that's been there for us and near unto us when everybody else left us. You're the one, God, that always loved us, always comforted us, always spoke kindly to us, always held our hand. You were the one, God, that was always there. So Father, I thank you for that, and I glorify you for that. I praise you, Lord, publicly. In the presence of these witnesses tonight, God, I, I give you the praise and the glory. For never leaving us and never forsaking us. Even Lord, if we made our bed in hell. The Bible says thou art with me. And Father, we just thank you God for always watching out for us. And never letting us go. I pray dear God that you would give comfort where comfort is needed. 
And God, that you would give correction where correction is needed. Father, grace and mercy where that is needed. Help in time of need. For those who need it, those who call out unto you, those who cry out unto you. Father, I pray, God, that you would give it to them and be ever near them. And Father, we just ask, God, that you lead us and guide us in our study of your word tonight. Help us, Lord, as we go through these pages and go through these words. Give us grace and give us understanding. And Father, there are people with us tonight, God, that are going through a tough time. Lord, you know all about it. And I pray, dear God, that you would help them tonight. Give them your grace. Give us your love, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, my mind is in the book of Daniel, so turn there. Daniel chapter 3. When I think of fiery trial, this is what I think of. Um, last Wednesday night, we were talking about the fiery darts of the enemy. And how the devil will attack us. He will come after us. He will try to ruin us. He'll try to destroy us. He tried to do it to uh, Brother Job. And when, when you read in the scriptures where the, the Bible calls the devil the accuser of the brethren. What you see in Job chapter 1 and 2 is Job doing exactly that. He's accusing God or he's accusing Job to God. Saying Job worships you because he's rich and because you've. You've given him all these things and you take all that away and he'll curse you. Then that, when that didn't work, the devil said, okay, touch his body and you hurt his life. Then he'll curse you. And, and God gave Satan leave to do that. And that didn't work. And God blessed Job and, and Job's heart then was revealed. And I want to say to us tonight that you always, you always sort of get your bearings right on where you stand with God, not when everything's going well, but when everything's not going well, and you realize that the only hope that you have and the only help that you have in life is with the Lord, that's when you really understand who you are and, and who you belong to. Let me hear you say amen. In Daniel chapter 3, I'm not going to read this whole deal, but you understand the chapter. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. When I see those two numbers there, I think of the image that the false prophet is going to have the world make to the beast. And those numbers there are associated with that image, 603 score and six. To me, it's no accident that this image was 60 cubits high, six cubits wide. To me, that just sticks out. That says Revelation 13 is what that does. And um, I'm not going to read all of this, but you know the story that Nebuchadnezzar sent word out that when we sound this music, if, if you don't fall down and worship this image when I tell you to, then I'm going to throw you in the furnace of fire. And so he made that decree. And I want you to remember what Paul said, that there's going to be a falling away taking place. And I, I want you to get to me. I, I like this image. You've got, you've got a million people standing out in this valley and they're all standing up and when the music starts, all of them fall down. It's real easy then to see who's on God's side. Because there's only three of them. They're the only ones in the whole deal standing up. Okay? When they say who's on the Lord's side, then it's real. I mean, we may not necessarily know who's right with God right now and who's not. And I know we're not supposed to judge, but I think there's coming a day when it's, everybody's going to know whose side everybody's on. I think God's going to make it that real and make it that plain. But um, in uh, verse 16, I like what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They knew they were talking to the king, but they knew that that king had a king over him. And they, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And I would to God that God's people resolve in their heart that you get it settled. 
One day, whether it's today, whether it's a week from now, a year from now, whether you've already done it, praise God, hallelujah, but that you get it settled in your heart that you're not going to serve any other God except the God that you know saved you and died for your sins. Somebody say amen. They believed in God's salvation. They were trusting that God would be with them. But they had it fixed in the, it wasn't just a mind decision. If it's a mind, if somebody can talk you into something, somebody can talk you out of something. But if it's in your heart, it's there to stay. God is the one who shapes and works the heart of man. God is the one who brought you to the place in your life to where you've decided this is the road I'm walking. I don't care if hell comes on earth. This is the way I'm going and nobody's talking me out of it. Somebody say amen. Boy, I wish it was Sunday. I'd be preaching like it was Sunday. Maybe that wouldn't hurt us tonight on Wednesday night. Amen. Can y'all handle that? But they had decided if God saves us, that's then fine. We believe God's going to save us. But even if he doesn't, it's almost like Nebuchadnezzar, you can take that golden statue and you can eat it for all we care because we're not bowing down to it. That's not our God. We don't serve that God. and We're not going to bow down to it. We're not going to bow down to any other God except the God of our fathers. And then you know Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake, commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. I like how this all works out. God had decided a long time ago that he was going to destroy the most mighty men in Nebuchadnezzar's army. Amen. He then doesn't, he doesn't figure this out. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You watch this. The very enemies that are facing you down are going to get destroyed in the very thing that they sought to destroy you with. You read Revelation 13 about the beast. There's a, there's a comfort given to the saints that whoever lives by the sword going to perish by the sword. So then Nebuchadnezzar king um, uh, was astonished, verse 24, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose. Four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is, say it out loud, it's like who? The Son of God. We know who that is. Amen. And Nebuchadnezzar knew who that was. Don't give me... I'm, these other translations call him a son of the gods. And they, and they... And I had a guy to me. He was one of these Bible... He was like I used to be. He was one of these Bible college smart kids, Brother George. He was in Bible college and he knew he was smarter than everybody else. And he wrote to me and he said... Now, you don't understand, Pastor Hoggard, that Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan and he served many gods. And so he only knew of multiple gods. And, and so he really did say a son of the gods. And I'm going, you tell me that Nebuchadnezzar was looking at Jesus Christ himself and didn't know who it was. I guarantee you he knew who it was. The fourth is like the son of God. Um, I want you to take your Bible and turn to... Um, Let's go, let's go to Genesis. Let's look at, that's one example in your Bible of somebody going through a fiery trial and they made it. They made it. It worked. They had faith. They trusted God. God did not turn his back on them. God did not let them down. God did not uh, run off and leave them be to their own. And the same is true with a man, now you can say, well, you know, here we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Boy, they were full of faith, and boy, they were steady in their faith, and they were sturdy in it. And, uh, and, and Pastor Mike, I, I worry about myself because sometimes I'm not that strong. Sometimes I feel like this world has a grip on me. And sometimes I, I wonder, sometimes I wonder. 
So let's talk about, there's, I think there's a picture of everybody in your Bible. And for those who are strong, those who are, I mean, a solid, then maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's for you. But let's talk about somebody else. Let's talk about a man by the name of Lot. What we know about Lot is what the Bible says about him, is that Lot was vexed because of Sodom and because of where he lived. If you remember, in fact, Genesis 13, 13, Genesis 13 just sort of gives us the idea of how Lot ended up where he ended up. And if you remember in Genesis 13, the herdsmen of Lot and Abraham's herdsmen were striving together. They were, there was a there was contention going on, I guess, over grasslands and well waters and things like that. And they were striving together. I mean, they were, God was blessing them, but there was, and there was just too much, too many of them in one space. And it was Abraham that went to Lot and said, Lot, Abraham showed meekness. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And if you look at what Abraham ended up versus with what Lot ended up with, once this whole deal was done in Genesis 13, God took Abraham and he said, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. He said, all that thy eyes that you can put your eyes on, that's what I'm going to give you. North and south and east and west are, they just keep going and going and going. And God gives Abraham the inheritance of the entire world. Jesus was right. And Lot lost everything because of his choice there. At Sodom, the, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And so the Bible says in Genesis 13 that Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. And it's a guess, but we think that Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's actually four cities, but those cities are in the area, sort of around the southwest area of the Dead Sea. You don't have to go there. You can go on Google Earth, or you can Google this, or you go to Wikipedia, or you can look up pictures. And that area, the Dead Sea, is the most barren, waste area in the entire world. There are no farmers at the area of where Sodom and Gomorrah are or used to be there's no farmers there's no ranchers there's no people growing asparagus and leeks and onions and garlic nobody has there's no olive orchards there there's no cattle there there's nothing there absolutely nothing there god did with it exactly what he said he was going to do with it and he turned it into a wasteland there's not even a city there anymore. Nobody, there's nothing there for anybody. There's, you can't make a living there. Before God destroyed Sodom, it wasn't that way. Your Bible's right. It was a well-watered plain. Grasslands, lush, thick vegetation, cattle. The markets were there. That's probably why Lot chose Sodom. He thought, you know, with all this cattle, I could be really making a fortune here. So he chooses to pitch his tent toward Sodom. So he could, he's got it in his mind, he's going to make a good living there. And what's interesting is that in Genesis 13, we see him pitching his tent toward Sodom. By the time we get to Genesis 19, he's living inside of Sodom. And I want you to take note of that. Our journey of coming back to God, you can follow Lot's progression of moving away from God, moving toward Sodom. If you've ever done that, you know exactly what that's like. You move away from God by moving toward Sodom. Here's Lot, one day he's pitching his tent toward Sodom. The next time we see him, he is inside Sodom. And the Bible says that he was vexed with their deeds. What that means is, here's what I think it means. It means Lot still had a heart that was for God. But he's influenced by what, by what Sodom 
is. Does that make sense? This world has its clutches on every one of us in one way or the other. I don't like it. You don't like it. But it has an effect on us. It shapes, the world we live in shapes and molds our thinking. And sometimes it's not good how that ends up. So anyway, here's Lot and he's inside Sodom now. And you see, if you read Genesis 19, you see the struggle that Lot goes through just to leave Sodom. I mean, as soon as he hears, as soon as these two angels are telling him, hey, you need to get out of here. Lot's trying to work out how he can save as much as he can or take as much as he can with him or whatever. He doesn't immediately say, we got to go, we got to go. The angels literally had to grab Lot by his collar and drag him. Angel got, got Lot, got his two daughters, got his wife, drug them outside of the city. of Literally drug them out. His wife, her heart was so inclined towards Sodom that she... Seemed like she made it out, but she never made it out. Her heart was back towards Sodom, and God knew that. That's why he turned her into a pillar of salt right then and there. But anyway, Genesis chapter 19, turn there. We have the testimony of, of Lot. And um, Let's look in, well, look in verse 1. There came two angels to Sodom at even. Those are the two angels that were with Jesus in the previous chapter that sat down and ate with Abraham and Sarah. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground and said, Behold, now my lords turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed them greatly. I mean, Lot knew where he was. Lot knew what kind of city Sodom was. And Lot is telling these guys, uh, you don't want to be out in the streets of Sodom at night. What a shame. What a shame that in America there was a time when you didn't have to be afraid of the streets at night. And now we can't even, there's places in this, there's places in Jefferson County, places in St. Louis County we can't go to at night. Wouldn't want to go to at night. Places where we couldn't be because it's too dangerous. What a shame that that's what our nation has turned into. But it's because we've walked away from God. So anyway, um, where do where I go? Look at verse 12. The men said unto Lot, Haste thou here, uh, or hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. We've been asking the question for years, how far does America have to push God before America has got to the place where Sodom is in this chapter? I mean, there's some things, there's so many corrupt, wicked, Sodom-ish things going on in our country right now. We have to ask the question, where are we and how God sees this country and how God sees our people? Where are we in relation to Sodom? Because if God doesn't destroy America or at least judge America... He'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah and every other nation that he's destroyed because the wickedness of America has to be crying out in the face of God. Can I hear you say amen? And we're living, I believe, in times right now where I think we, I think if we're wise, we ought to see this coming. Verse 14, Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. And I want to say this. To anybody that's listening, if you're lost, and you're listening to this because God wanted you to listen to it, and your heart is not turned over to God, 
You need to get right with God. Have your sins forgiven. Fall upon the feet of the cross. Come to God come and beg for His mercy and for His forgiveness. God promised He would give it. God, listen, God, Abraham talked to God before this chapter and said, God, if you find 50 righteous people, will you not destroy Sodom? And God said, if I find 50 righteous people, I won't destroy it. And then he worked it down to 40. And then he worked it down to 30. And then worked it down to 20. And then worked it down to 10. And God said, if I find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I won't destroy it. God destroyed Sodom. What does that tell you? Here is these two angels who worked out this miracle right in front of Lot and his family by causing all the Sodomites, these wicked, perverted people, perverted people who wanted to... Who wanted to have sex with these angels. And they turned these men blind. And his sons-in-law saw that happen. And Lot is saying, these guys telling us he's going to destroy this city. We need to leave. They wouldn't listen. I think that a fiery trial is going to take place in this country. Can get amen out of somebody. And we're trying to warn people. And we're trying to wake people up. And it's like we're talking to deaf people. It's like we're talking to people who have no concern, no care whatsoever about where their soul ends up. That bothers me. And it should bother us if we know somebody that's not right with God. It should bother us and we ought to pray and ask God to save the people that we lo listen I know he's not going to save the whole world we don't love the whole world but we love people that we love and we want them right with God can I hear somebody say amen but some people you're like I said you're listening to this message and what you're going to do with it is you're going to turn a deaf ear to it and you're not going to give it another thought and you're going to think that once I'm done, I'm going to shut up and that's going to be the end of it. And you won't have to listen to it anymore. And when you stand before God in judgment, he's going to remind you that you heard this message or somebody else's message. He's, he's going to remind you that you heard it. I, I know pastors and preachers that are street preachers and I've done that one time, scared me to death, but God let me do it. And I, I used to think, you know... Standing out on the street in the middle of a city, preaching to people like that. He's not seen anybody come to the Lord because of that. And I think, well, that, you know, you're probably wasting your time there. But then I don't think that anymore because I think God has these men out there because there's going to be people that's going to hear that and they're going to go stand before God and say, well, I never heard the gospel. And God's going to remind, He's going to play back the whole message to them, every word that they heard. He's going to remind them, you heard, you just didn't want to hear it, you didn't listen, and they turned their back on God. The angel said, we're going to destroy this place, and Lot tried to get his sons-in-law, and they wouldn't do it. So verse 15, when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, see, he's still hanging on. I want you to ponder that for a while. I say that we've got, the world's got its clutches on us. But I also believe that there are things that we're holding on to in this world. That we don't want to let go of and we don't want to quit. We don't want to get away from them. We want to, what we want is we want to keep a little bit of the world in our life with us. And not let it go and think that that's okay with God. And I see that here in Lot. Lot is tarrying. Lot is lingering. He's waiting around. It's like Sodom has vexed him so much that he really, there's a part of him that really doesn't want to leave. Now here's something that I've learned. Something that God has shown me years ago. There's not anything in this world 
that ought to hold us back from serving God, doing right, and being ready to leave whenever He calls. Husbands, wives, moms, dads, children, grandchildren, jobs, money, status, fame, fortune, glory, whatever it is. There's nothing in this world that's worth losing your soul over. Nothing. And maybe, just maybe, God loves you enough, He'll bring you to a situation where He'll take everything away from you. And then He'll bless you and He'll use you but you got to be willing to let go of Sodom. Amen? Whatever that is to you, whatever that is to you online, I don't know who I'm preaching this to, but you got to be willing to let go of Sodom. Lot's tarrying, Lot lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, verse 16, upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful. Watch this, look at your Bible. The Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Um, turn to, um, well, look in verse, I got it up on the screen. Genesis 19, verse 23. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire. From the Lord out of heaven. I want you to think about that. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. I want us to go take your Bible, turn to, to Jude. I have it on the screen, but I want you to look at it in your Bible. The book of Jude, I believe, is written for us who are living in these last days. Um... I want you to, let's start reading in verse 5. Jude says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. Think about that for a while. If you've read the Bible, go back and read it again. And then when you're done, go back and read it again. And then go back over it again and, and spend the rest of your life going back through the Bible. Because we will learn things and we'll forget them. They'll be out of our mind for a while. Peter always talks about, I'm going to put you in remembrance of these things. I want, to, I want you to remember these things. God told the Israelites to do the Passover every year. And he said, this is going to be a remembrance. I want you to remember. I want your children to ask you, Daddy, why are we doing this? What, what is this Passover all about? God, what, why does this? And the dad is supposed to tell the children, son, this is how God saved his people. This is how God saves us. This is how God does it. And so when Jesus was there with his disciples at Passover. You remember what he said? This do, how? In remembrance of me. So when we take the Lord's Supper, when we do things, we're to remember, we're to put it back in our mind and remember that. When you were in school, if you can remember back that far, when you were in school and the teacher was writing something on the chalkboard, he was talking about something in class and he said, remember this now, what was that for? Why did he tell you to remember that? You were going to see it again. And this Bible is set to us to remember these things because we are going to see them enacted in our life. I'm one of these, I don't think there's a page in this book that doesn't have some sort of significance to our life at one time or another. So he said, I want you to remember this, though you may have put it in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. What did he do? He saved his people and he destroyed Egypt. Right? He saved the Israelites as they walked. They didn't walk over the Red Sea. They walk through the Red Sea. What color is fire? It's 
red. Okay, that red sea and salt water, if you ever get it on a, on a wound, it burns. In fact, salt is a picture of fire in the Bible. A salt and a burning, God said. So they're walking through the Red Sea. And then God draws their enemies in after them and closes the Red Sea on them. They're destroyed in the fire. And Israel is saved through the fire. You see that now? That whole deal is a picture of the fiery trial which is to try you. And the same story here with Lot. He says in verse 6, The angel which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Those angels are in the pit right now. And when that, if you look in Revelation 9, when that pit is opened up, what comes out of that pit? What's the first thing that comes out of that pit? Smoke as of a great, Say the word furnace. Because that's what's in Revelation 9. A great furnace. And that's where those angels are right now. And then look in verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. See, God didn't just, just destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, we'll go to Deuteronomy 29 here a little bit. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam. How many? Four. There's a fourth kingdom going to take over this world and those four cities are a picture of that they're a foreshadowing of that and God destroyed them while he saved his people you look in your Bible again verse 7 again even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to what now it's not just the sin of sodomy that God's going to get this nation for. This country is a very adulterous nation. Am I kidding? Am I making that up? We are sick in this country with adultery, and fornication, lasciviousness. We're sick with it. And God's going to judge this country because of our... It didn't used to be that way. And it's worse now, I think, than it ever has been. And it's not getting any better. Amen? Giving themselves over to fornication. Going after strange flesh. There are things that come to me that people send me stories about what's going on in this world that I don't even like to talk about, especially in a company where there's children and things like that but this world even in technology is turning itself over to strange things they're set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of what what does your bible say eternal what fire the fiery trial came but god saved lot his two daughters, out of it. He saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of it. He saved Noah and his family out of it. God is in the saving business, while at the same time, He is in the destroying business. And I just, I don't know, I just feel led. I want to appeal to somebody listening tonight, somebody watching online or whatever, you need to get saved. You need to turn your life over to Jesus. You need to come to God's mercy seat and ask God to forgive all your sins. And he promised that he would. Salvation's free. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I just, I don't know. I'm hoping that somebody hears this tonight and, and gets right with God because God has to judge this world. But, according to what we read in 1 Peter, he's got to set the house of God in order first. There's an example of that in the scriptures. We don't have time to get into that tonight. 
But that is exactly what God's going to do. So verse 8, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. And um, let me read, while we're in Jude, let me read verse 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken. Again, do you get the idea that he's talking about ungodly people? He says it about a hundred times there. These are murderers, or murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. He's talking about what Peter said and what Paul said. Scoffers shall come in the last time. Mockers shall come in the last time. People are going to come in the last times and they're going to try to refute the word of God. They're going to try to mock the word of God. Uh, somebody sent me a deal today. You've, if you've never seen it, you ought to go to it. But the creation science people built a replica of Noah's Ark out there in Kentucky and they turned it into a big museum. Lisa and I and Caleb went out there and it's pretty cool. But apparently some public schools were taking students there on field trips and the ACLU threatened to sue any school that went out there on the field trip so the creation science people who own the ark said, we will give free admission to any school students who want to come here and view this. We'll let them come in for absolutely free. And I went. I, lo- I just wish they used King James verses in there. But anyway, they're, gonna, they're hating us already. They're mocking us. They're calling us fools. They're calling us idiots. They're calling us all kinds of names. Because of social media, now these things are on the rise. And at some point, this world is going to turn their hearts against God's people. It's going to happen. So you might as well settle it in your mind. Live for God. Amen. Fiery trials coming. It's coming. And maybe some of you tonight are already, in fact, I know you are. You're already going through it. And my heart's with you tonight. And um, we're going to have a prayer time in a little bit. And I want us to pray for one another. Pray that God will help us. God will show us what he's going to do for us. God will lead us. God will guide us. God will take care of us. And uh, for us to pray for one another. All right. Uh, Michael did make it out of Kenya. (sighs) For those of you who don't know. He was scheduled to leave last night and the apartment where we stay when we go there, he was staying there. Well, there was a terrorist bombing not too far from there. And I mean, not too far from there. They had all the roads blocked. And I'm telling you, in Nairobi, when you block one road, the rest of them are terrible. And how he got to the airport, I don't know. God must have, God must have flew him out there. But he made it out of Kenya Um, but his flight was late, so he missed his connecting flight in Amsterdam, so he's holed up in Amsterdam. He's got, I think he's got a flight out tomorrow. He'll be back home tomorrow, so praise the Lord for that. But pray for him. Um, We are scheduled this Friday to feed uh, our food program going on this Friday. Um, Michael told me how much food we've bought. We bought over 4,000 pounds of corn and beans. That's a lot of cornbread and beans. Okay. Uh, but we're set to distribute over 4,000 pounds of food this Friday. Okay. To everybody that's helped out with that, I want to tell you thank you. Uh, but be sure and tell God thank you for laying it on your heart. Okay. I mean, it's a big thing to, to feed that many people. That's a big thing, okay? So I'm very appreciative of, of what God is doing over there with that. And I just want you to continue to pray that God will continue to use it and bless it, all right? If America won't listen, we have at least got people in Kenya that will listen. 
That's, that's worth a lot to me, all right? 